Mm. Mm. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. You just step your game up. That's all. That's all. That's all. You just... We, we, we're going to attempt to be good tonight. We are Facebook Live. Um, what's wrong? You think I'm going to mess this up? You don't trust me? <laughs> I don't know what it is about Monday nights and acting right. Just don't go well. Um, so we're in, this, we're in Ephesians chapter 1. I want to continue this discussion. I won't put a whole lot of pressure on y'all like we did last week. Last week was a lot of talking and a lot of answering, and we're going to give you a break this week. It ain't even a dry erase board out here. If you notice, it's gone. I got, you know, I won't so that you get, guys can have a break. Now I don't want to be tempted to cut up with the cameras on, okay? So we're going to just read one verse here. Now, typically, um, this verse is used to win dates, to win debates, about soteriology, and soteriology is the study of salvation, how a person gets saved. And this verse quite often is debated uh, between two camps of people. I'm going to throw it out there. You, it may not be of importance to anybody in here, but just so you know, one is called Arminian, the other one is called Calvinist, or what some people call Reformed theology. You can study all this in your own time and, and allow the Holy Spirit to draw you a conclusion. That is not where we're going to land ourselves uh, this evening. I'm not going to be discussing the depth of salvation and what that means. We primarily want to look at this verse, uh, and we talked about what was the key word last week. Does anybody remember? I am blessed. Boy, I got a lot of teaching to do, Nick. You see that? You see that, Nick? I got a long ways to go. I got a long, a lot happened last week, didn't it? Didn't it? <laughs> and so he is now laying foundation on several key words that we are supposed to be uh, viewing as being blessed. And so... We talked about last week, I think it was Michelle who was like, some of us don't feel like being blessed is how much money you have, what job you work in, where you go to school. And so Paul is now going to lay out for us his definition of what it means to be blessed in heavenly places. Now, I'm, I want to give you guys background so you can kind of understand his heart. And remember, Paul has a Jewish background. Now, these new Christians still read the Old Testament. They're just looking at it in a new way. Jesus taught them the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy specifically. All right. What is that? The Pentateuch? Help me, Nick. Those first five books. So, huh? The, or the Torah. Yes. Penta meaning five. So you can call it the Pentateuch or the Torah. Those first five books, um, the, they would study. They're studying it with a new mindset now because they've met Jesus, and they found out that this ain't about religion, okay? I got to remember the camera zone, because you... <clears throat> this ain't about religion and religious... I, Jesus didn't come to start a religion, okay? He come to establish the kingdom of God, all right? And that's a way of thinking, and that's why we're looking at this this way, uh, part... part just a part of our mental health um, and establishing some healthy dialogue with the Lord in our minds is us understanding um, how the Bible was wrote, why it was wrote. If your Bible was wrote to tell people what to do in a bunch of rules, those environments are not, don't foster mental health at all. Okay, so Paul is looking at the Old Testament and he's explaining, he's being, he is, God is revealing himself to him by the Spirit from the Word. And that's kind of the primary way that God reveals himself. You read the scriptures and there's a sense of when you read your Bible, you should ask yourself, what does this verse tell me about God? That's kind of the first question we should ask her. What is this verse revealing to me about Jesus, God, or the Holy Spirit? That's kind of the first question you should ask. Not, well, my, my taxes are due. Let me see what the Bible says about 
<laughs> the Bible says pay your bills on time. Get it right. <laughs> All right. So you can, if you're not careful, you, you'll find yourself, you know, misinterpreting scripture based on what you're going through and you start projecting it, what it doesn't mean. Guilty as charged. As a matter of fact, to make myself feel better, I'll say we all do that. You know, that makes you feel better. It's like, you know, I mean, I know I cuss, but everybody cuss. Okay, well, we talk about you right now, boo, but, you know, make myself feel better. We all do it, okay? And so um, I want you to understand where Paul's coming from. Paul's going, okay, I'm, I, and so actually this verse that we read, there's several places in Scripture we're going to look at, and all of these verses have Old Testament readings attached to them. I'm going to show you that. And most of the New Testament has Old Testament readings attached to it. Most of the time when Jesus is talking, he's quoting Old Testament passage. It's just, we, it has a whole new light on it. Does that make sense? So one verse here, we're talking about, if we're blessed, what are the privileges of being blessed? Okay, and this first verse is going to give us the first privilege. Even as he is God, chose us, we're talking about God the Father, so we're talking about Trinity now. So I want you to, I'm going to be stopping and saying that a lot, three in one, Three personalities, one being, all right, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I think it's important that we um, d differentiate in this text who he's actually talking about. So here he, he's implying God the Father, even as God the Father chose us in him. Now the him there is actually God the Son. He's implying the Son Christ. Anytime the Bible talks about us being in one of them, we're either filled with the Spirit, in the Spirit, or in the Son, okay, in Christ, right? Every time we read Scripture. So I want you to kind of have that on your mind. I want you to see these two personalities in this text. Even as he chose us in him, the Son, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. So the first uh, benefit to living and having more so, understanding the blessed life is to know that you've been chosen. And I just have one question I want you guys to kind of talk to me about, then I, I don't think I'm asking more questions. Maybe, just to make Nikki mad, I might add one more on there. Um, chosen. What's the good that comes with somebody saying, I choose you? What's the bad that comes with what? When is it a good thing to be chosen? When is it a bad thing to be chosen? Somebody throw out, when is it a good thing to be chosen? When is it good to that you're chosen? When is it good for you to go, oh, I was chosen? Give me a time where it's good to be chosen. You get an award, pick up ball, <laughs> if you're good, I guess. <laughs> I guess the draft, yeah. When it's time to eat. Oh. <laughs> All right. I see y'all are tired in your minds as I am. <laughs> any, other, any other time it's good to be chosen? The lottery might be a good time to be chosen. <laughs> The lottery, um, I, being signed to a record deal, right? If you were chosen by a record label, you're like, yeah. I mean, if you have talent, you know, you get up there <laughs> with no talent. But if your aspiration was to sing and it's a grind, and I guess maybe being chosen by a record label may not be a good deal. Maybe chosen to be viral would be a better deal, you know, but I don't know. But you don't understand what I'm saying. There are these times um, when it comes to, you know, that, that high school crush, you go all the way back to your, some of you may not be able to go back that far in your memory, but go all the way back to the time in high school where you liked somebody and they chose you and you had that sense, you know. Every once in a while you'd be in the club, right, with your homeboys standing, you see these looking at you, so you kind of, you know, kind of separate yourself from them to see if she's still looking. She's looking at me, yeah, she's she looking at me, yeah, i just making sure, yeah, she chose me. That's a good feeling. That's a good feeling to feel chosen. There are some things that is not, comes negative with feeling chosen, especially in the kingdom. Um, uh, um, some people will come into the kingdom with a survivor guilt. Survivor guilt is when there's a bad car wreck, 18 people die, one lives. It's like, why did I live? I don't relate to that. Some of you do. I don't. I, I'd be right back at that same club. I lived. I lived. I lived. <laughs> but some of y'all don't relate. <laughs> some of you don't relate to that. Some of you relate to going, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I lived. Why me? Why did I live? So sometimes it's like, why did God choose me and not that person in the outer Amazon in the middle of the woods? And some of you can't really walk in this truth till somebody can theologically explain to you how come a person born in the middle of Madagascar 
and I'm and I don't have that personality, so I wouldn't be hung up on that. But some people can be hung up on that. Or if you chose for something negative, you know, if we if the military came in here or some group came in here and kicked the door down and was going to kill one person in the room, they said, "I choose you." You're like, "Oh, really? Okay. Like, oh, it's because I got a red hat on. You pick. Come. On. Why don't you get somebody with one of some of these bald people around here? You know." You try to, that's not a good time to be chosen, right? So there are times where it doesn't feel good to be chosen, and we got to weigh this in our head as we're looking at these scriptures. What is, what is wrong with me believing, and what's so bad with me thinking that God handpicked me? In my thinking, do, I, do you live a life that says, I've been handpicked by God? This is not a new thought. Okay, this is a thought that Paul um, is reading the Old Testament and it's being revealed to him as he reads the, the Torah, as Nick said. So very first thing, he loved and chose us first. That's the very first point. He loved and chose us first. And I want you to think about one of the things I get in trouble as a preacher. I think most preachers, we go straight to doing. We want you to go do things. And we're Americans, and we're Protestants, so faith without works is dead. And so we are doers. However, I think we should spend some time thinking about what this means. He loved and chose us first. No matter what you believe about salvation, whether a person gets chosen by God and they don't really have a choice, or a person gets to choose whether or not they serve the Lord. Whether what you believe, it doesn't matter what you believe, whether we have a choice or don't have a choice. We do know that if God doesn't move first, you ain't going to get saved. So we have to have a move of God first. All right? And I will put a verse up there. It's on your note sheet. So you see our love for him comes as a result of his loving us first. God, the Father, is the initiator. He is always the one that starts the party. The party don't start until God the Father shows up. Amen. You've got to know that. So why is this healthy for us to think this way? So we've got to figure out. Why do we need to be thinking this way? Why do I need to have a sense of God chose me? God selected me. God wanted me. All right, and I want you to really be thinking that, and you got to get corny. Some of you went two days saying you was blessed. You had a good last week, you had a good Tuesday and Wednesday, and you quit on me. Okay? And I'm not going to be up in here begging y'all and on the Facebook going, all right, now don't y'all forget, y'all chosen. Don't forget, y'all. Come on now. I was like, I'm not that type of trainer, you know. You, you just missed two misses, two misses. I ain't coming to the, no more to work out with you. All right? <laughs> You're on your own, all right? So I, I really want you to be thinking about that this week now. Why would this matter? Now, let's say you, let's use sports for a second. Or, or yeah, let's use sports because I can't use modeling. If I use modeling, all the women in here, oh, here he go. <laughs> let's use sports. Let's say, let's say you're shooting baskets and Curry stops by and goes, man, you can shoot, man. Keep shooting. Keep shooting. I like it. I like what I see. I like what I see. How would that make you feel? I mean, you guys don't know who Curry is. God, I got to think of Michael Jordan. Does everybody in here know who Michael Jordan is? <laughs> Lord, help us. And Michael Jordan chooses you. Well, how would that make you feel? There would be some sense. Or if you could sing and, 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 and somebody endorses you, um, and I can't even use any analogies because I don't even know no popular singers no more. I mean, I stopped listening when Maroon 5 came out, so that's where I'm at. I ain't listening to nothing since Maroon 5, you know. I'm still stuck on this love, so y'all, I'm way, she will be loved. I'm still trying to hit that note. I'm still trying to hit that note. She will be loved. So... But you can see us, you know, or the voice, right? They hit the button, they turn around. There's a great thing that comes with that. There's something that comes in your identity, right? When somebody, that's not what's going on here. <laughs> he did not choose you because you sing so good, okay? And Paul's looking at the Torah, remember? And he's, he's thinking about this, and he's, he's staying consistent with Scripture. So God's choice towards you ain't because you're so gifted and you're so talented and you're so precocious and so wonderful and so cute and, and mighty. All right? That's not what's going on here. He actually uh, has a different thing in mind. This is what it says. For you are a holy people, dedicated Lord your God. He has chosen you, talking about the Israelites, from all the people on the face of the whole earth to be his own chosen ones. Okay, this is this was for the people 
that followed Abraham and got circumcised, right? This is who he's talking to. Everybody, that's why I was impressing upon Nick and our staff. When Abraham, when God chose Abraham and called Abraham out and said, from you is going to come a whole nation of people, he didn't change his color. He didn't change his DNA. Because in the kingdom, race ain't about color. The kingdom is race is about what you believe. Okay? And so my brothers and sisters that are woke get hung up on this. But you got to be real careful. You can start worshiping wokeness instead of worshiping the Lord. You can start worshiping your, your country and your flag instead of worshiping the Lord. I give up all of those things to now be with a kingdom citizen, to be with God, to be in God's possession, to be God's chosen one. So he has the same narrative. Now here's the one. The Lord didn't set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number. He said, y'all wasn't the, the most. Y'all wasn't doing the most. He says, matter of fact, you were the least of all. I could have chose a whole bunch of other groups. Now, this is where we philosophically as Christians, and I'm not going to get in that night. If you want to stay and talk about it, I'm sure me and Nick can stay. I mean, I'm talking about the other Nick, not this Nick. But me and Nick Marco can stay and philosophically talk about how this works theologically and philosophically. I don't want you to get hung up on that, but if you do, that's your business. But it could be the devil tricking you, okay? Um, because and we're going to get to, we're going to, we're going to dive into this a little bit. But I do want you to be careful, and I want you to think about you. This is this next several weeks, you're going to be selfish. Well, what about everybody? We ain't talking about everybody else. We're talking about you. And I know good and well, if I work for Warner Brothers, and I called you and said, I listened to your YouTube video, and I heard you, and you can flow, and I'm going to front you $10.5 million, and I want you to do four albums with me. We're going to front you and your tour, and then we're going to give you 60% of the tour, and we're going to give you all your merch. Will you come sign with Warner Brothers? They're going to go, well, what about Cornell? Did y'all call Cornell, too? You ain't going to ask about Cornell. You don't care. You're going to be like, babe, I did it. I told you to believe in me. We out. I told you I knew what I was doing. You wouldn't be asking about Cornell, but then when God starts talking about salvation, you say, well, what about Madagascar? Okay, so don't, that's the devil. You don't do that with no other reasoning. Am I making sense? All right, so I'm making sure I made that clear enough, so I'm helping the devil get up out this room. He's exiting, so we don't have to sit here and debate that tonight. We'll do that for another day, all right? Being chosen primarily is what I want you to go away with is it's that... It, your definition of God, who is, is he, is he, is, now when you're with your kids and you go, it's time to go to bed, why? Now, some of y'all are good parents, most of y'all are white, and you will explain to them, <laughs> these black parents are why? Because I'm your daddy, and I made you, and I'll make another one look just like you and bury you, all right? Okay, so go to bed, because I'm your father. And there does come a place in your parenting where you know your kids don't understand it. Amen? Amen. Your four-year-old don't know what taxes is. You can probably explain. You can give some candy and take some away. Well, that's stupid, right? They don't understand it, okay? So there is some of that with God, too, and it's his choice, and it ain't because of your merit. It ain't because of your talents. It's because of his sovereign choice. So with that, if God has a sovereign choice, look what he says here in Deuteronomy 26, 18. You are his very own people just as he promised, and that you must obey all of his laws. And so he said, I chose you to do life this way. I chose you to do life this way. And so if God has a choice, it means he's up to something, and it means God has a purpose. So if you're chosen by God, you got to start thinking, what did he have in mind when he chose me? Now think about an infant Anybody have any infants in their home right now? All right, you got a little infant, so, so can they make breakfast for you? What, what really can they do for you? They, they give you work to do. That's about it. They really, they really don't, they, they ain't going to get you breakfast. They're not going, you saying she's still an infant? Okay, bless your heart. We'll pray about that here before we go. Um, um, so that's you, just laying there, and you don't have the sense God gave a mule because you're just an infant. But he has a purpose for your life. You, you, even with your own kid, as a parent, you have a sense of purpose within you when you're parenting that kid. 
There's a sense of a direction. You're de- matter of fact, the Bible says kids are like arrows, and we should point them in a direction, right? And so God has a purpose in a baby way. I'm kind of explaining this in a baby way so we can wrap our minds around it. God has a purpose for your life. You are not just some random thing happening. Even if your parents thought you were random, you know, even if your parents didn't plan, you always see them commercials, baby, yeah. <gasps> oh, there's something like that. What family is that, y'all? Where the girl comes on the corner with the little test, baby, look, yeah. No, she comes around, um, <clears throat> we need to talk. Uh, you got to get a second job, yeah. <laughs> Looky here, uh, yeah, it happened, and I don't know how, but uh, so this is, even if that's the case, even if, you, you were adopted or, you know, whatever. God has a purpose for your life. And we love this verse. Most of the time we know that all things God works for good with those who love him, those who has called according to his purpose. Now, remember, Paul, inspired by the spirit, trained by the word of God, the, the Torah, is drawing this conclusion with that as his foundation. I'm, I'm keep saying that this God is not saying anything new. There's a new way to look at it, a new way to think about it. Most of us don't need new wisdom, don't need new knowledge. We need to think correctly about the wisdom and the knowledge that we have. That's most of us. Most of us go to counselors because we're hoping they'll say something in a new way to help us understand what we already knew. Okay? You really don't. It ain't out there somewhere out there. It's in you, boo. You just ain't thinking correctly. All right? And and that's what Paul is letting us know, man. God has a purpose. Whether it's Joseph, who's put in the pit, God had a purpose for that. David, you know, saw her taking her clothes off down there on accident. He said it was on accident, right? I didn't mean to be out there at that time looking over there. He had binoculars, a whole station set up. (laughs) She's going to be out here in 30 minutes. (laughs) Oh, that's my bad, you know. And, and, And from that, Jesus comes from that lineage, Solomon. And all of that. And he was, it was another woman. It was another woman's, uh, another husband, another, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, John the Baptist, he was told he was going to be the forerunner of Christ. He was told all these wonderful things about his life. He didn't know he was going to die in jail. He didn't know that. All of that had a purpose. So the question of the hour is this, Justin. How do I accept what I see and still obey the Lord? And that's what we're hoping that we can get with this purpose and chosen. How do I accept... What I see and still do what God has purpose for me to do because he's up to something. Even if I don't like what's happening to me, he is up to something. You are chosen. That is so. And and I told Nick, it's dependent on the circumstance that sometimes you'll handle this really well. Sometimes you won't. It's just it is a life. We're going to have this lifelong fight till Jesus returns on walking this out. Every day, it's a lot, and just when you think you figure it out, then you find out. Um, I was at, I was, I was, I planted a church, and the and the 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 dude stole all the church money. They vest, they, they they he was an investor, and then people invested all that money. I'm talking millions of dollars, and he ran out. Of, <laughs> took, I'm not, I'm laughing now, but at the time, boy, woo, they gonna burn that church down, okay? And you, and then you can get up there and read Matthew six to him. Hold on, you guys. Hold on. Is that don't don't put all your trust in earthly things where men can come in and rob and rust and rust. Jesus said, "Seek ye first the kingdom." I want my twenty million back, bro. I hear you. I want, and then for me, it has just been seventy dollars. I want my seventy dollars back, bro. I ain't leaving. I get my. 70. I hear y'all with y'all's thousands. I want my seventy back. <laughs> all right. So there are times where it don't matter what verse they give you, right? And people mean well. When you lose that loved one, here they come. God plucked a rose and in his garden in heaven. I don't know what they're talking about. I'm like, what are y'all talking about? They got their angel wings now, and they're just flying around. I'm like, okay, that y'all, we get weird at funerals trying to make people feel better. Can't find one verse. Well, so-and-so's got their angel wings now. What are you talking about? It just makes me feel better. Okay. And we need that stuff. That's, the funeral ain't for the person who passed away. It's for us. Okay, so there are all these moments where it's hard to accept what you see. I just don't want to accept this. So this is why this I am chosen for this, whether you're Job or Gideon, all right, whether you think what you're chosen for is a good thing or whether God chose you for a bad thing, 
You need to know you're chosen. God has a purpose for this. There was a purpose for this. And we got to learn how to call on him. The writer says, I call to God the most high, to God who fulfills his purpose for me. So your first reaction when you're starting to see yourself not like what you've been chosen for, all right, is to start calling on God like the two speakers talked about on Sunday morning, your prayer life. You're going into your prayer life with the sense, I have a father, and I'm going to talk to him about it. Because he's chosen me. I'm his kid. And later on, we're going to, the word that, that Paul uses is adopted. He uses adoption. And we're going to talk about that uh, in a few weeks. When we talk about being blessed, it's to start thinking about what it means to be adopted by God. Okay? Right? So chosen, you have purpose. What do you think about that? I'm not asking you what to do. I'm asking your thinking. What goes on in your mind when you hear this? When you think about all the heck that you've been through, when you think about all the wreckage that maybe you've even caused, why is God choosing you? Now, we do background checks, right? When somebody wants a job, we, do, we call the references. Will they be on time? How do they do this? And based on the background check and the interview, we'll go, no. God got the background. He did background, foreground, middle ground. He knows everything about you. All the stuff, the, not the stuff, I'm not, the stuff you kept to yourself, nobody knows, God knows and still chose you, okay? So there's great purpose. Now, you can sit around and be guilty all the time, and some of you love that. Some of you, guilt is a wine, and it's a sense of it's bad theology. If I feel guilty enough about this, I can make up for what I did, and that's not true. You're just a miserable person. That's all you are. You're not making up for anything, all right? So some of you will sit in your guilt and love to feel guilty all the time, and some of you just pretend like you've done nothing, but repenting and coming to the finished work of Christ is his blood is enough. He has chosen me. And it's not because I'm the strongest, baddest, coolest, make all the right decisions. That's how we choose people. That's not how God chooses people. As a matter of fact, we get this wrong all the time, especially in the church. We, uh, the, the single mom with the six kids, we'll try to find that corner for them. And the person who owns a bunch of Sonics and a bunch of restaurants and Tim Tebow, we'll put on the front row and even hand them a mic. We don't know if the celebrity saved it. If Jamie Foxx came here, we'd hand him a mic. Go ahead, Jamie. Well, pay the Lord. <laughs> you know, we don't know how, if he's saved or not. Hand him a mic. The single mama with six kids, we ain't handing her a mic. Right? So the church gets this wrong all the time, and God chooses the ones that everybody else would not choose quite often. And so you got to be real careful. I, be real careful who you pass judgment on. You be real careful. We're going to be really disappointed if we, if we had the same mindset when we went to heaven, some of y'all would leave. You'd be like, well, I ain't trying to be here. Look who's here. <laughs> you know, you just wouldn't want to be there because it's not going to be who you think because God's choices are way different than ours in this regard. So if God chooses, he has a purpose. So that means remember when Mary was looking for a room and there was no room in the inn? Y'all remember that story on the Christmas story? Please tell me we know that story. And she kept, no, there's no room in the inn. That had a purpose. There's a purpose for that. Now, in the moment, she's feeling rejected, right? There's a purpose for that. Remember when Jesus said, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So virtually and essentially, Jesus was homeless. He didn't have a mortgage, and there was a purpose for that. Okay? There's a purpose for that. He was couch surfing way before it was a thing. Okay? And there was a purpose for that. Okay? Remember Judas and his betrayal? He's a disciple of Christ. There's a purpose for that. When they were spitting on him and mocking him and put the crown of thorns on his head, and even up to the point of them putting that spear in his side, there was a purpose for that. There's a purpose for all of those images. 
All that has a purpose. We went to Atlanta last year, and they had a, one of my favorite pastors. His name is Charles Stanley. He's an older gentleman. He's getting up there. He's retired now. But I love to watch him in, get interviewed and ask questions because he's a cool leader. He almost reminds me of Pastor Rick, kind of the same thing, kind of the same personality. And, and he's just been in all kinds of church challenges. I mean, he's been in a church challenge. That, I mean, he's been his, Andy Stanley said he's, he, his, this deacon was going at his dad, and the deacon punched his dad in the nose and gave him a bloody nose. And his dad just picked his glasses up and said, sorry, you feel that way, Mike. I said, glory. Oh, glory. Boy, could you imagine me and Tevin? Me and Tevin both have been scrapping. <laughs> Tevin been five years old kicking him. Get off my daddy. <laughs> oh, it would have been bad. It would have been bad. Oh, man, I was like, wow. The church didn't want them to be. He has one of the largest ministries in the world. And when they first hired him, there was like a big group of people that didn't want him to be the pastor. I mean, he has been through it. As a pastor, I've never seen a pastor stay at a church where he was vilified as he was. And he has, they said, how did you do it, Charles? How did you keep going on? How did you keep preaching? And he has this saying, obey God and trust him with the consequences. Obey God and trust him with the consequences. Not since we went to that conference, that's what I've been living by. It's like God has chosen me to be in Southeast Kansas for whatever reason. I believe everything that happens to me has a purpose. I got to stay within my obedience and trust him with the consequences. That's my goal. And that starts here. You don't leave the house if you haven't thought about it and think you're going to do this. That ain't, like I said, the first person punch you in the nose, you're going, you know, you know, I don't, I don't know why we're so silly. Um, I don't know why we're so silly like that other than our depravity. So you really want to get that way. And, and there are some bad, I don't want to be dismissive. You know, I don't know why what happened to me as a five-year-old was in God. I don't understand all that God was doing with that. I don't know why God would have me. It would make more sense for me to take my gift to the inner city. If I'm God, I'd put this kid in the inner city and plant a church in the inner city and use him down there. I don't know why God called me to Southeast Kansas per se. And we have to remember this. Isaiah said, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways. The way that I do things, the way that you do things, are as far as the east. He says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my... We cannot begin to see all the pieces to this jigsaw puzzle. That's what, if you could, guess what? He's not God. So you got to first start asking yourself, what is my definition of God? Is God somebody who has, I have the same abilities as? And he's kind of a consultant. I mean, he is far more, infinitely more. There's no way to measure him. There's no way to quantify his abilities and his strength. He's way outside of us in intelligence. He's not consumed by time. He's not consumed by time. So if you're 13, so we go, a 13-year-old die, why so early, God? Why so early? And then a 93-year-old lives to their 93 or whatever, and you're like, what a nice long life. And it, when it compares to eternity, they are the same. There's not a, we, when you compare those times to eternity, you can't get them on a graph. You can't, there's no way we can go, there's a 93-year-old, there's a 13-year-old. Okay? So we, the, we don't look at this stuff the same. As God. And we, every time we start feeling discouraged and depressed, we start really thinking. This is what discouragement does. It narrows what depression will do and discouragement will narrow your focus. And you start thinking the way that I see it is the only way it is. And what I'm hoping when you start going, okay, I'm blessed. I'm chosen. I'm hoping it starts opening so you can start seeing more. But we're never going to see as much of the page as God can see. And there are some bad things that can happen. Man, I, oof. I mean, we're living in some awful times. You're not even safe. People are disrespectful at church. When I was a kid, the last place you cut up at was church. They will, if you, I don't care if you're four, get up in that altar, that four-year-old, and run on the stage. They will tear, and it ain't even your parent, some random, some random mother of the church. Will tear. I wish you would get up in the pulpit. If you ain't a pastor, they start snapping. Excuse me. Excuse me. Yeah, come on out. Come on. Come on down. Yeah. Don't you get up. That's just. It's different times. Now they will go and shoot a church up. They are not studying God anymore. Matter of fact, 
It used to be even Darwin in his atheism said that God was a good thing for humanity because it was a barometer to keep man in check. Even Darwin said that. Now they say the idea of God is a bad thing. So we're in a whole different time in that regards in our country's history. But in all of that, with all of that that we can go off about and everybody can be stuck in, God has a plan, he has a purpose, and he's chosen you. Okay? Now, I spelled this wrong, and I hope you all caught it, all you English majors, but yeah, thank you. I spelled that wrong. I was, I, I was tired today. I ain't studying y'all. When I say that God has chosen you, I want you to know it's well thought out. Okay? I want you to know that it's well thought out. I want you to know that God choosing you, he's a thinker. He has really thought about this. It's a, it's a coolest, you can be confident about this. He has thought this out to the, for, on, a, on a very macro level and a very micro level. And you guys remember when I was all fired up around Easter time, because I just get fired up. When I, thinking about God's intelligence just blows my mind. It just blows my mind how smart God is. I just, I, I baffled by it. But just when we talk about the Passover and how he covers every single tittle of the law and how even Jesus entered that city, it just blew my mind. And then when you think about the human body and just your eye, if you were to study the human eye and how awesome the eye is, I, I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone and he is a, but what, did, what did he tell me his title was, Nick? He is a bi, bi, biological evolutionist, something like that. I can't, I don't, thank you, evolutionary biologist. Yeah, yeah, I don't even know how many, that's like 97 years of school. Um, and, and he was like, what nobody talks about is like half the science community is saved. Half the science community believes in God. It's just this fake narrative that half of people who believe, or scientists don't believe. There's a lot of people who study science and believe in God. They, there's just no way it can be random. They just, there's no way. And if you were to study the human eye and the fact that we can see each other, it should cause a worship experience. It will blow your mind, the human eye, and how much goes into you just being able to see it just blows your mind. Now, that soundboard is very difficult to understand. I don't fully understand it. But what I do know is that them random pieces didn't just come together and make this beautiful thing so that we can get sound coming through it. I know that didn't happen. I know somebody put some energy and some design into that to create that. And I want you to understand, with your life, even with the negative disappointment, so you could be like, I, I mean, you know, you growing up as a kid, you just think you don't like your parents. And you're like, man, why well, can't I have this mama, you know? You know, I used to pray some awful prayers to God about my mama, right? And, and so you can think that, you know, to the parents you were born to, the siblings you have, the way that you were raised, you can really get beat up by that and go, what in the world? I remember the first time I got exposed to, like, family, like, in a biblical way, and I thought, well, where were you at with me, Lord, on this? I'm not knocking my family, but I just went to a healthy family, and I went, okay, now, wait a minute. What's it? Okay, wait, what's that? Oh, this is a count that we opened up for Billy. So when he goes to college, he's got, yeah, and we're, we're kind of struggling because he only has 27,000 in there. I don't know how he's going to get through four years. I said, 27,000? I <laughs> I'm like, man, listen, me and Pell, we was best friends. Me and Pelly Pell, oh, yeah. Yeah, me and Pell, Pell, Pell. Had some sleepless nights, right? So... I was listening to people talk about that, and they got the money they set back for their kids to do this, this, and this. And I went, well, what is that, you know? And, and you will start questioning, did God know what he was doing with your life? Or did he go, or at least he went to sleep. And he's like, I'm going to go to sleep on DJ, you know. Good luck, bro. Figure it out. I went, okay, so that's how you'll feel. But I want you to understand he's well thought out. And, there, and, and I got that thought from this, even as he chose us, in him before the foundation of the world. So God had thought about this choice before he formed the world. He was like, I'm going to make this girl named Lisa. She's going to be born here. She's going to go here. She's going to move here. She's going to do this. That's crazy to me. Wrap your mind around that. You figure that out. You are a scholar. All right, that's just cool. That's just really cool to think about. Like, man, man. And remember, he's reading the Old Testament the Holy Spirit is speaking through the foundation that he was brought up on. He's just thinking about it differently now. 
Look what Jeremiah says. By my great power and outstretched arm, I made the earth and the men and the beasts on the face of it, and I give it to whom I'm pleased. And so the Lord, he's taking this thought. This is a very consistent thought in Scripture that God is so powerful, so intelligent. He made the earth, the people on it, the beast, and he gives the land to whomever he pleases to give it to. So you think you're really doing something. You ain't doing nothing. <laughs> Makes me smile. <laughs> um, it's a tough thing to wrap your mind around, though. Look what uh, they, Luke says in the book of Acts. God began by making one man, and from him he made all the different people who live everywhere in the world. God decided exactly when and where they would live. So if you're hung up on the person in the Amazon, you need to understand that God decided for them to be in the Amazon. I'm going to let that marinate for a second. I want you just to marinate on that. That's tough to receive in a lot of ways. Because your life would be dramatically different. If you were born in Egypt, you'd be a whole different person. If you woke up in Taiwan, you'd be a whole different person. This is really hard to receive, especially if you have a really ultra-negative upbringing or you've had a tragedy. Um, now, the Bible, if you read the whole Bible over and over again, the Bible says not to be surprised when tragedies happen. The Bible never promised that there wouldn't be difficulty, evil, tragedies, tough times. Matter of fact, the Bible promises that that will happen. Okay? We're the ones who are shocked. And I think it's because we get saved and we go straight to doing and we never have a time to really think about what the gospel is telling us. The pastor goes, now you're saved. Now, now move out and you get a new place and y'all separate and then you don't cuss and don't you, you got to put the cigarettes up and then you can't do it. And now come on, now you got to get over it. And then we start making people do a bunch of stuff instead of going, let's, let's work on this mind transformation. Let's work on what the scriptures are saying and how you think before we start just rearranging your house. You know, and your pastor's sitting next to you. You go to smoke a cigarette, and he pulls a cigarette. Oh, you live with us now, pastor? Yeah, I'll be living here next six weeks. It's like it gets really ridiculous, okay? And, and, and you spouses, you know, if one of you grows too fast, you will do this to one another. If somebody gets fired up, you know, you, uh, my favorite thing as a pastor, me and Nick talk about this sometimes, is when the, the wife is saved and the husband's not saved, and then the husband gets saved and then he gets fired up, and the wife is like, slow down. Like, what you doing? Where are you going with that margarita, though? Oh, okay. Now she was spending all this time judging him. Now he's super saved. You ever see that before, Nick? And now he's like, uh, I thought we were saved. <laughs> and what you really need to do is work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Stop meddling in your spouse's walk. Now, don't be using that as to win an argument two days from now. <laughs> now you heard, Pastor, stay out of my... <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. But God knew exactly what he was doing when he made you and put you in the home and, raised and, and, and allowed you to be raised in the home that you're in and the relationship you're in and those failed classes and those dropped college courses and all of that. He knows about all that and he still chose you and he's still at work and he has a purpose for your life. All right, and he really thought this thing out. Okay, He really thought this thing out. Here's the last point that I want you to get. Being chosen by God is what produces holiness and blameless. And so I didn't want to make this point because we don't like the word holiness anymore. Because it, does, it doesn't just imply the word perfection. It literally means saint. Okay? It means a person who acts right. This is the goal. The goal is to become from an ain't to a saint. That's the goal. However, um, you need to understand that this Holiness and blameless comes from what Jesus did on the cross, not from your effort. So you need to think about that first before you try to, oh, I'm going to be holy today. Not if you don't have the right way of thinking. You're not, okay? If we're not healthy in our thinking, we can't live holy. You must see what God has done, not what you need to do. When we start talking about holiness, you have to look at what Christ has done, not what you think you need to do. You can't do enough to make yourself holy. So you have to continue to gaze upon what Christ has done. Jesus makes us holy and blameless or not guilty. Actually, the word blameless means no evidence. So, you know, you think about CSI, you think about law and order, if you're a person like that, or those documentaries on Netflix, it always boils down to evidence, right? 
Am I the only one who watches that stuff? I love this stuff, man. And dude started picking on Netflix last night. I said, I can't give up my documentaries, Lord. And they start eliminating them. They don't have, they can only charge you with what they can prove, right? And so Jesus comes on the crime scene, takes your fingerprints out of there, takes your DNA out of there. No evidence of the crime. He removes all the evidence of the crime. So the enemy can't even bring up charges against you now because you've put, like, there ain't no evidence of that. You see what I'm saying? Therefore, if the glove don't fit, <laughs> if the glove don't fit, right? And, and, and so we, we must look at what Christ has done, not what we need to do. If he doesn't get rid of the evidence for us, we're going to jail for a long time and we're going to face the death penalty. Right? If, he doesn't, if he doesn't remove the evidence, that word blameless means unblemished. So you think about those, those tied sticks, and you, you put the spaghetti on there, and then your mom soaks it, and then gets the tie, and gets that stain off it. That's the same thing he'd done, uh, uh, done with us. That we, used to, we used to sing those type of songs, right? You know, Jesus paid it all, all to him my home. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. That's what it means to be blameless. So here's, here's my, my major thought about being chosen. Okay, this is my major thought about being chosen. Your who comes before your do in the kingdom. Your who. And, I, it's, and us pastors are guilty of this. We go straight to doing. And we don't ever have you think about your who and And thinking about, man, I, why did God choose me and all this stuff. All right, so last week I played some songs. I'm actually going to play a whole song for you. It has lyrics on the screen. I want you to sing this song. If you're watching online, we're going to close down the broadcast now because all it's going to do is tell us this song is copyrighted and it's going to mute it anyway. So God bless you for being tuned in uh, tonight. Uh, and, and if it ain't kingdom, it ain't worth it. But people here, I want you to stay there. I'm going to show you this song.